full disclosure, Sally and I were students at the same time at the same school. I was a uh, first or second year undergraduate, uh, and I'm quite certain Sally had zero idea who I was. Uh, she was a PhD student and progressing steadily through the program and talked then in glowing term, talked about in glowing terms. You know how students talk. Oh, who was your TA? Sally, she's amazing. And then when I started an MA there and Sally was still around, uh, she was still talked about in glowing terms with admiration. Uh, her research was already top notch. Fast forward another gosh, eight or 10 or 12 years. It took me a while to get to Trent. Uh, and I find myself in a department with Sally and have discovered what a generous and honest colleague she is. Uh, that promise in grad school as a teacher, a researcher, and just as a good person uh, has been kept and fulfilled here at Trent. And one of the real pleasures this summer was getting a chance to talk more with Sally about the challenge of teaching online during a pandemic. Uh, and I've wanted to showcase her work for a while now. Uh, Sally has uh, a unique experience. One of her courses in third year course in the English department is called Cichlid, uh, is one that she built on her own, right? So she built this course as a kind of remote course and she built it uh, in its format on her own. And another course in health humanities is one that she built with our good friends at Trent Online, one of their super builds. And both courses are inventive and clear and engaging. And she created both courses with that sense of possibility. What's possible in this environment? And her students and their learning are clearly at the center of her teaching. Uh, Sally's going to share both courses with us today, uh, with an eye, I'm sure, on how they engage students, uh, but also with a special eye trained on assessments. Uh, that have worked well for her. And then we'll shift into questions after she walks us through those courses. Uh, I'm sure I'll have somewhere between 17 and 42 questions, uh, but I'm also going to look to all of you uh, for questions uh, about Sally's courses uh, for her. Uh, and we are recording so we can share this resource with everyone else. Uh, so Sally, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Joel. And thanks everybody for taking the time. I know times get even more complicated as we go on. And, you know, that was an amazing introduction. So a million thanks for that, but also to you and your whole team for all the work you've done to get us where we are right now. Like there is no, uh, there's no way to ever thank your team enough. So I did both of these courses remotely. And although I have a lot of experience using Zoom for research, I actually haven't taught very much on Zoom. Uh, can you see my notes or just my course? Right I can now? just see your course right now. Okay, that's good, because my notes are <laughs> just for me. <laughs> so I really think about this past year as being partly about forms of expression. And that's very convenient, because as you know, I started my career as an English professor, and that's really my disciplinary base and home. And so in English, we teach forms of expression, we study forms of expression. And I really tried to turn to the year, I'm not pretending I was successful the entire time at this, in a fairly practical way, but also trying to find a bit of joy in creating new things myself, as well as giving my students some opportunities to try out forms of expression they may not have tried before. And this isn't brand new to my teaching. It's something I've done since those times that Joel was talking about, actually. And for a while, I taught at both Concordia and McGill universities in that kind of dance that we often need to do in academia, that precarious dance. And I really learned a lot from the different students that were at Concordia and McGill, particularly in harnessing what kinds of skills of expression they already have. So Cichlet, which is the one that is on the screen right now, I've taught that for a number of years at Trent. It is a course on illness and literature, kind of simply put. And it draws a mixture of really engaged English majors as well as interested non-majors, particularly since some of the sciences have required a humanities credit. Students come to this course because they want a credit that they can see how it's more relevant to what they're wanting to study. 
So this going remote semester really gave me an opportunity to switch sick lit up a bit. And I, I'll be immodest and say I got really good feedback from students, including saying they think it should always be remote. <laughs> so I'm thinking about that possibility. One of the main changes that I made to the course was I did my lecturing by podcast and I really loved doing that. I divided the course into modules, five modules. I did cut back on the material, the kind of content of the course and really moved more towards the kind of activities and uh, what I wanted the students to be bringing to the course. And I guided them through that with this podcast that was, it was about an hour of lecturing every two weeks. I set it up on Podbean so that students could access it away from Blackboard. They could go walk in the woods because I knew that was what I wanted to be doing. But I also did provide a note-taking guide for accessibility reasons and so that people could follow along more easily. In terms of assessment, which really is our focus today, I was able to adapt my key assessment idea of the rotating assignment in a way that I found worked even better in this remote framework than it does when we're meeting in person. So what I always do in this course for their main assignment, they have a choice between writing an essay, which particularly English majors like to do, uh, or giving a presentation. This allows students to build on the skills that they already have or their strengths if they want to, or to pick something that they know they need to improve, like giving a presentation, for example. And the way that I was able to do this online was um, I could have the presentations due in the middle of a module because the modules were two weeks and the papers due at the end so that the presentations that happen in the middle of the module really became a key part of the discussion, the participation part of the course. And I also took out the midterm exam this year, which is something that will never come back into this course. It really, I, I really learned how it had been acting as a motivator, certainly for students, but not necessarily fulfilling the goals of engagement and not actually giving me what I want, which is assignments that I wanna mark. Right, things that I actually want to spend my time uh, engaging with. And I think that if I'm more interested in uh, engaging with an assessment, then students are probably more interested in it as well. At the beginning of the term, and this is why I have uh, this module up first, I let the students uh, choose which week they want to do their assignment, or in this case, which module. So they not only choose between a presentation and a short paper, but they choose their topic and their deadline from the very beginning of class. And this has a couple of benefits. First of all, students love to choose and to kind of think through and you have the planners and then you have the ones who would rather be doing it the very last week. And you kind of get a good sense of who's in the room or on the blackboard from the beginning of the course. It also means for me in terms of grading, it's spread out throughout the semester. I never have more than 10 assignments in a week from this course to grade, which means I can get feedback and meaningful feedback back to students within a couple of days. There's a certain point in the term where I'll be honest, that ends up being more like a week, but it does mean they're getting really strong feedback and detailed feedback right away. And I found that really helpful in the remote environment where students felt a little bit less like they had connections with and knew how they were doing. Hey Sally, could I just jump in quickly? Now, what, yeah. size of, what size of group is this? This was 49 students. Yeah. Good, really, really good question. It was capped at 50. So um, yeah, so it's not a huge course, but I think the same principle would apply, right? In terms of, of spreading out the assessment, just the time frame of responding would change a little bit. That also helped to address one of the challenges with this form of assignment, which is it's hard to scaffold an assignment if some students are doing it the first week 
it's hard to then build up the skills in the following weeks in a way that feels fair to those students who went first. So I was able to do that through the feedback, which is guiding them towards the very final piece of assessment in the course, which is called a final exam, but really is an essay assignment that I give them the questions for a few weeks in advance. And I always include a kind of so-called creative question in that usually involving aliens, i.e. aliens have landed in Peterborough for reasons that are very hard to explain. Not only are you having to define illness to them, but you can only use the text from this course. You know, some students hate that, they run away, they go and they do the essay assignment that is also there, right? Like talk about fathers in two of the texts. Okay, good, mine, comfortable ground for some students. But for other students, this really gives them a sense of audience and who they're writing to and kind of frees them from wondering what I might be expecting because they assume I don't have a clear expectation of what one might say to aliens. And then I also this year, and this was based on something that Kathy Bruce said, I think, during the town hall. And I just, I ran with it and I made participation worth 50%. So it's 10% per module. It happened on VoiceThread, which worked well because I was doing the student, the students were posting their presentations on VoiceThread. So they had a kind of stake in something too engage with and honestly I saw the best writing I have seen in my teaching career. I think that's because it was worth a lot, sure, but I also think again it's because students had a sense of their audience. A lot of them treated it like a discussion board. Many of you probably know and my dog is in the background very excited about this idea, but <laughs> many of you probably know that on VoiceThread you can comment recording your voice, recording a video, or typing. And students did a mix, but some of them really picked up on being able to do the voice comment. And feedback that I got in the feedback forms that I used in the course was that um, they, they, didn't, they weren't sure about it at first, but once they tried it, they really felt like they were in a kind of asynchronous seminar room, which would, is what I was trying to, to get to. So I do think students were more engaged last semester than I've seen in a very long time, that the students that showed up wanted to learn and were ready to do the work. And that was probably uh, a factor. And I'm not sure how I will, and this might be something that people might have ideas for, take that very high, uh, amount of their grade to discussion to a live discussion because one of the beauties of voice thread or a discussion board never thought I'd ever say the phrase one of the beauties of a discussion board but one of the beauties of that is that you can go back when you're evaluating and think about what people really said there there is a record right so I felt more protected in that way and I think students did too right because they could go back to uh, what they had posted. And I tried to make it clear that for the final exam, the take home essay, they could use what they had already contributed in the voice thread. Because it, it was like what you would say in person, right? And something that you might say in a room, you are allowed to write into your, your final uh, exam if it, if it came to that. Um, so that's what I found with Cichlid and the voice thread engagement in that course was incredible. And I think it was partly because I had students who were adept at voice thread already, who had done online learning before and taught me how to do it. If you were ever nominating a student for a teaching award, I have one in mind. Uh, but it, it also just really, I think, spoke to some of the strengths that humanities students have. And so I'll use that as a pivot to the other course that was the super build course that Joel referred to that I had the full support of Trent Online for. So this was a brand new course. It was added to the calendar in May, but it didn't even show up in the calendar until the end of August. So it had a mixture, it had 31 students, a mixture of science, social science and humanities students. And people kind of came to the course in some instances by accident, which made it both really exciting and a bit of a challenge. 
And this course was divided again into five modules and each module had three components to the assessment. So I'll just, I'll show you the first module, which was on the topic of public health humanities. So I use this image by Julia Henderson of frontline responders to get the idea right into people's minds that this pandemic is also a moment for creativity and to kind of point them to the way that healthcare providers right now are turning to the arts to get into one of the main topics of the course, which is about how the arts illuminate ideas of everyday health, not just the clinical encounters, but getting at how small a part of an overall health experience, that moment of say diagnosis that the doctor's office might be. We used an answer garden and I used this in Cichlid as well, having learned it from Trent Online where students answer just a really basic question. And this, this question, uh, who are the heroes of COVID-19? It's not exactly a trick question, but the, the whole point was that there isn't one hero and that we're causing a bit of a problem when we use this idea of the hero. So I was trying to get students uh, to do that. But within each module, the students had to uh, both keep their notes and hand them in. And I called it a sketchbook because I wanted to get this idea of creativity really broadly used, but these different modes of expression into their mind. So I had these sketchbook moments all noted by an icon from the noun project that uh, Maureen found from us. And so, so some people typed up notes they might the way they might type up their reading notes. Other people, for example, for this one, drew a picture of a brain and did like a mind map on the brain on the two different sides. And I was trying to get them to start thinking about the forms of writing and creating that would help them learn that would help them engage with this subject matter. We did also use voice thread for the, what I called the course chat, which I regret. And next time I will just use discussion and use the kind of I don't, it was a bit too babyish of a term, if I'm honest. So, you know, you live and learn. Uh, and that happened over at voice thread with uh, very guided questions always with this icon so that the students could go through and find the icon and go to what they wanted and they oh what which question they wanted to answer they only ever had to answer one question per course chat so they had choice built in and i didn't have to divide them into group a group b group c group d they went according to their interest and of course some students answered all five questions and went into a discussion so that was my choice rather than saying you need to post three by Friday and they have to be a hundred words or one post and, and one response. Because again, I'm really interested in the variation of expression and the different ways that, that students can approach things. Some students can make one single paragraph comment that could cover the work that other students might do throughout the entire course, right? We all, all are already aware of that. Each module also had this thing called a studio activity. And again, I'm not sure that these metaphors work or hold and whether I'll keep them. But the idea was to go to some kind of space that is creative for the student and make something. And the first one here um, as a response to, the, we watched a film about AIDS, one that featured Dr. Fauci, so very topical, um, was really just to get them to try something. So it's not uh, as guided and they could do photography, film, collage, audio recordings, cartoons, paintings, or just kind of surprise me and somehow answer this question. Any student that had a little bit of uh, nervousness about doing it in that way, usually wrote up something to explain it to me, right? And then at the end of each module, they handed in their sketchbook and their studio assignment, and they'd already done the course chat. And they were asked to consider these questions each time they handed this in. What are they most proud of? 
what's their most telling contribution? I would find something with fewer metaphors or, or ways of interpreting uh, next time. Which element do you think isn't the best focus for you right now, i.e. which didn't really work out for you? And then ask them to talk about what they'd like to improve or build on as you move forward in the course. One of my favorite responses was a student who every single time said, I'm proud of everything or I wouldn't have handed it in. Always good to know you have a student, you know, who has the same kind of heart and approach as you do. But other students would say like, I'm really proud of this one. It took me forever. And that was really helpful for me to know, right? That, okay, this drawing of the brain and the two like health humanities versus public humanities took this person hours. So of course they, they skipped over something else uh, a little bit more. And so every other week I got both a studio assignment and a sketchbook and I was able to grade and give feedback right away. So there really was kind of constant feedback and that's one of the main ways that I connected with the students it was quite labor intensive. So I need to think through a few more ways of giving myself and the students choice for that, right? And it, I think we are all aware that this was a semester where we took that kind of recommended practice of lots of small assignments, but we all did it at the same time. And that led to some challenges in terms of grading and also for students having so many different deadlines. I did find, I didn't have very many humanities students in this class. And that meant, I'm generalizing here, uh, that meant that I found the students really followed the rules and, and took the deadline seriously and did everything on time. And we're like, okay, I see there's five sketchbook moments. I'm doing all those and, and did hand them in. It also, I think meant that the discussion and the voice thread wasn't as rich and I can see the ways that I would change this. For example, next time, I think I would make the studio assignment something that was posted on VoiceThread and the main part of the discussion. So you, you post at least one studio assignment out of the five studio assignments, for example, on VoiceThread and you give feedback to one that's meaningful for you. That kind of um, change might be po more possible over time now that I've learned the course, right? Because I was learning the area, how to teach it and how to teach online all at the same time and rapidly. So there's a lot of learning to do. And I think I need, so I basically, I think I need to build some of the flexibility for Cichlet from, that I have already in Cichlet into the Health Humanities course, and then some of the scaffolding, the very careful scaffolding from Health Humanities into the Cichlet course. And we were all building in this course towards a final gallery project. And this was something that I wanted them to do a final creative project that connected, and I use the term creative really loosely here, right? But like thinking outside the box, let's just say, um, that connected students' experience with their learning from the course with the main goal being their reflection on the learning from the course, right? So they aren't graded for the form of the assignment, although some of them are impressive. And Maureen Glenn from Trent Online gave me the amazing idea, and I'm so grateful to her for this, of creating a final website. And so that's what this is here. And students had a choice about whether they wanted to show their final assignments. And I will tell you, every student who did a collage did not choose to be in this final uh, website for whatever reason. Um, but a lot of the students did, and they were the students who chose a digital story approach to their final assignment or a board game, or as you'll see, there are a couple of sculptures. And so the uh, final assignments did tend to align to different units in the course. So this one, our first unit that I had showed you was the public health humanities one, and particularly they zeroed in on COVID-19. So I tried to give a little explanation in the site of what that was. And then this first one is a short video that a student made about her experience working as a nurse on the front lines of COVID. And she videoed her daughter learning how to ride a bike and use that as a metaphor. It's really quite spectacular and moving, I think. And then this one, a student created COVIDopoly a board game. So we had had them play a game called Spent 
that is an online interactive game where you get a certain number of resources and you make a couple uh, choices about jobs and so on to teach the social determinants of health, right? And how much broader than the clinical encounter they are. So that was part, I think, of what gave her this idea to make a kind of narrative game uh, based on Monopoly. And she spelled out the different cards and so on. And each student, as I said, did a reflection. And I have those uh, excerpts from those on the site so that you can see what they meant. And then this one was about uh, uh, ripped from the headlines, kind of using pace in a digital story format to show the kind of whipping up of a frenzy. And then there were a lot of students who wrote about diagnosis because we talked about that moment of diagnosis and how power can shift in that. That was one major unit. Uh, and then we also had a unit focused on social justice, had one student who wants to become a dentist because of her own experience growing up in a uh, family that immigrated here who were afraid of the dentist. So she did an information pamphlet to try to um, allay people's fears about uh, going to the dentist. Uh, and then this one, someone used waste to create a toilet to talk about sanitation as part of public health. And this is a student who grew up somewhere where the kind of easy access to toilets that we have isn't obvious. So I won't go through uh, every project I could. This is what I would love to spend the rest of my time doing. But, and, and I think that's sort of how I would conclude this part is to say that there was a lot of creativity and joy in this for me. And so at a time when I normally would be like, oh, thank God I'm done grading and I'm just gonna go, you know, try to deal with the Christmas that's coming at me. Instead, I created a, a website, right? So in some ways that was extra, right? But I really felt like I was giving something back, learning a new skill myself, because I'd never done this kind of design before and able to share it with the students. And then next year, I'll be able to say to students in this course, here's some examples and we can continue to build on it so that it won't feel quite as out of left field as it did for some of my say biology majors to be being asked to craft like a sculpture out of a, a toilet. Although that idea was all my students, I shouldn't take any credit for that at all. And you know, I also I learned how to sound edit to do the podcast, right? So I think that's just my final point is that there were a lot of opportunities this past year that I want to keep building on for us as uh, faculty to learn how to to create and change our forms of expression. I think I'll leave that at, at that for now, Joel. Yeah. Thanks, Sally. Uh, thanks so much for, for sharing your courses, but also sharing your reflection, right? Uh, what I really appreciate, but what, what you shared with us now is how reflective you are about what, what worked, but also those, those tweaks uh, that you'd want to change uh, as they move forward. Uh, and if you want to go back to the courses as we answer or ask questions, as, you, as we ask questions and you answer them, uh, feel free to share again uh, your screen. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to ask everybody in the room to see if what questions they have. I only have 63. I, I lied before. It wasn't between 70, 17 and 42, but I only have 63 questions. But the, the first question that I, that I wanted to bring to you uh, was about uh, your comfort level in marking creative assignments. Uh, I think you're talking about, you know, what you learned in terms of sound editing, what you learned in terms of uh, building the courses, you know, using Answer Garden, uh, but I'm also curious in how you think about grading creative assignments and how that's different from and similar to marking, say, a traditional essay, uh, and how you adjusted to that kind of assignment. Yeah, I mean. I'd love to have a conversation about how people grade conventional essays as well will be you'll see the direction of my answer from that and I think I'm fortunate in that I started doing this when I started teaching like literally last century so I have had some opportunities to try this before this kind of rattling last year. I am grading based on critical engagement with the materials right and and I think it does help too to have a literature PhD where what we do is find meaning and 
critical reflection in artistic projects, right? So that I, I see it as somewhat analogous. I did for Health Humanities provide a rubric for every studio assignment that had some basics, like you need to talk about two topics or this needs to clearly be about COVID-19 or it has to have something to do with a metaphor. So really kind of basic. So if students needed to see like, what do I actually have to do? It's there. Uh, but really, I and I I did not grade form. So this the, this isn't an art class, right? So it wasn't like trying to grade, and that's where the studio metaphor might not work, right? Because it wasn't like trying to grade uh, a studio kind of assignment, right? But and I mean, I I can see Nadine is here, and she has brought me into uh, the world of of digital storytelling, which some of my students did work on, and I would like to find ways to build them towards that even more carefully. But what we know from that is it's the process as much as the product, right? And so what I find with grading these projects is, is you do get to um, learn a sense of process. And for the final studio assignments, they had to do this artistic statement, which is a little bit of a kind of insurance policy for both them and me, right? Because I do have written reflections on what they said they learned they have the opportunity to say like I was trying to I'll just show you this last one which is a comic oh no I'm not showing you my screen anywhere I'm looking at a comic um you can show that a mind. student hand drew right and I can see like every stroke of the pen so I know that they put time into it and I think it's tempting to think that that time isn't necessarily critical engagement but I expect it was right and I'm not saying I, I kind of give credit based on a guess, right? But there's some time um, that it takes to create these kinds of projects that I do try to honor, right? So um, I, I mentioned the collages, right? And there are none on the website, but there, there are some collages that were not showing great critical engagement, right? that didn't give credit to the sources. I couldn't tell what the aesthetic or the thematic rationale was. They had to do for their um, studio, or see, this is why the, <laughs> yeah, their studio assignment for the fifth one was a pitch for the final gallery project, which I think is a really useful skill for students in the future anyway. You're always having to pitch stuff, no matter whether you're like trying to get a bank loan or in some kind of job or whatever. So very practical skill. But I was then able to give feedback and say, okay, if you're doing a collage, right? And I did just get um, a collage submitted by a student who is a little bit behind in handing some of the assignments in. And that collage is all eyes. <laughs> And there's a reason why those eyes have been chosen, right? So like I can already tell that that's more an A range collage, whereas something else might be more of a C or B range collage. And I know you're thinking about the studio metaphor. I, I, I will say that one of the things I, I do like about it is the way in which it helps alert students to the ways in which the, the assignments themselves are scaffolded, right? Leading towards the eventual uh, creative project. That was the idea, like sketching yeah. while you're out and about and then going to the studio to create something more deliberate and then having like a vernissage at, at the end. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's valuable. And, and I would say just in my own teaching, that's one of the ways in which my creative projects have maybe not been as successful as the ones that, that have taken place in your courses because I haven't set students up to be successful uh, in that scaffolded way. Uh, what other questions do people have uh, who are in this room? Can I, I thought of a, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Sally. Uh, can I ask something about the voice uh, thread? Because um, yeah. like I, I, I used it like with students, but I put the limit of two to three minutes of their videos and I see how the, they interact together. together. Um, and I, I actually struggle like with I see some students spend time on uh, uh, like putting feedback to other students or posting voice, uh, you know, comments or 
uh, and I struggled with how how do you grade those students or um, using the the voice thread for for me it was challenging actually. Yeah, I found it complicated as well, although not more complicated, less complicated, I would say, than grading in-person participation, which relies also on memory. And I, like I, I appreciated for VoiceThread that I was able to sit and take notes and make a record to myself towards the grading. I know it's not linked directly to the grade book, but I've never used a discussion board that apparently is. So that wasn't a challenge for me. I actually printed out the class list and I kept a tally of plus if it was like a really great contribution. I got a little confused between a slash and a kind of a minus or a class slash and a tick. And then a minus if it was like, well, they probably logged in like they tried or even, you know, they're bringing the conversation down. And that gave me a bit of a visual representation of quality and quantity that I used to come up with a general idea of the grade. And then I went back and I found once I got rolling with it, it was quite time consuming for the first module. Yeah. But after that, it got a little bit easier to do. My concern is if these courses got bigger and I had a teaching assistant and was trying to explain how I was going about it and keeping the consistency, that's mm -hmm. something I'm trying to think through. But I didn't want it. So to be clear, I wasn't just counting like, okay, they did 10, mm -hmm. right? So there were, and there were some who didn't do what I asked them to do, which was always come back like just make sure you come back so that it's a conversation there were some who it's just their their work habit their way of working was end of the module they'd come in and post but oh my goodness some of those posts were essays you know yeah. like really really significant so they did still did quite well in terms of their grade do you think about using structure uh, like to make their presentation structure to, to answer some questions or to focus on some points that if they are not there in the video that you can uh, mark it ac accordingly? I think that that could be a really good development in the cyclic course in, and, and start working towards some form, not exactly of scaffolding, but of buttressing because this is one of the challenges of the way that I do that rotating assignment where they choose a paper or a presentation, but I don't give them essay questions. And that has sometimes results in plagiarism, right? Because I haven't guided them enough. And so I think there's a fear that comes with like, I don't know what she wants. And then I'm teaching the bell jar, which is available on all kinds of websites and so on, right? So I think that if I had more guided questions for the papers and for the presentations, that would really help that. I would always give students the ability to go outside of those questions if they chose to. But I did find the presentations, which were posted in the middle of the module, they tended to take up the questions that I had posted as what I called course chat. I used that course chat thing in both my courses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I, I wouldn't use that phrase again, but you know, the discussion questions mm -hmm. that I posed to them, a lot of them, if they were looking for, you know, what direction they wanted to go in, they picked up one of those and then they did a presentation on it. And then they had questions for the students. And sometimes the students, so the students who were doing papers handed them in at the end of the module, so they would have had the benefit of seeing the presentation. And sometimes, and these were really nice moments, they took a discussion question from one of the student presentations and wrote their, their paper on that. And another benefit I would say from this rotating approach is zero requests for extensions because mm -hmm. they've changed, they've chosen. Right. Yeah. Once in a while, always, someone's like, I don't want to do a presentation. I Can I switch to a paper? And that's fine, right? Like I allow that, obviously. I allowed anything any student asked this year, to be honest, but I didn't get extension requests. Thank you so much, Sally. And uh, you, clicked, you clicked my mind now. I'm going to use uh, 
because I have a discussion uh, for mm -hmm. the third one before the midterm. I want to use a voice thread in the state for that discussion. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, I it, it as long as the students have used voice thread for something, I think it would work well. There is a learning curve for sure. Mm -hmm. And where I found voice thread let me down is that it is higher bandwidth than I thought it was. So, and I was really, both of these courses were asynchronous. I was trying to be as low bandwidth as possible. I did have students, I know, driving to the Wendy's parking lot at night to do their work and to engage, right? So, but they were able to do voice thread in that way because they didn't have to do it on Zoom at 2 p.m., right? Or come write the exam at three. I was really um, trying to, to avoid that kind of request of, of the students I had, because I did a questionnaire at the beginning of both classes to ask what kind of devices they were connecting on, what kind of connectivity they had. Thank you. You're welcome. Ray, I think you have to unmute. Were you trying to jump in there? Yeah. <laughs> so yes, the unmute. Um, I have a question uh, about the the kind of workload and work quality, work quantity um, aspect of the. It was, I guess, especially in the cichlid, they're harder to know with the new one because of the first iteration. So you talked about the cichlid one um, in contrast to an, the earlier version that you had done. Of uh, you had you you reduce the kind of the amount of whatever contenty yeah. stuff uh, in it, and and I know one of the big discussions in having courses going online was, you know, kind of recommendations to, to try to do uh, less stuff, presumably, or hopefully, to give a, an opportunity for kind of more deep focus within a smaller number of things. But how was your sense of that? And maybe for the next time you would be doing that course in terms of, uh, because you did fewer things, do you think it was uh, easier? Do you, for this, from the students, would they have said it was less work or would they have just said it was uh, the same amount of work, but more intense on a fewer things? How did that sort of, what's your sense of how that would be? I think they found it was the same, even though honestly, it was about a third of the amount of reading, mm -hmm. but much more demand on them to actually show that they had done the reading. Right. And I think that's a, a kind of general finding that that people are discovering what I would like to do next year. And I think this could work, whether it's remote or in person, is have more tracks through the course. So because I have other modules I can put together because I've taught it before, I would like to create more modules, but not require students to do more modules. So I would love to have the course be, say, there's eight modules. You have to do the first one because <laughs> that's where I lay out the theory and I need to know that they know that. And then you have to do like three. Uh, okay, my math is probably off. But anyway, you have to do like four <laughs> out of however many I'm able to put up. Um, and, and I think there are ways to do that in person or remote or as a flipped mm -hmm. classroom kind of module. And I really, or a model, and I really hope that we are going to have the opportunity to create some hybrid forms of courses for next year because I think the time really is now while we're fresh on what we've learned. Um, I And while we can think about, I mean, Joel talked about possibility, right? While we can think about the possibilities that we've realized in this incredibly difficult year, like I really think I was a better teacher this year and I was ready to reinvent my teaching. Like I hadn't been teaching as much because of different secondments. And so I, in some ways I was coming back into the classroom this year. So there was that aspect of it, but I could see being in person the first couple of weeks while we establish a dynamic, get to know who's in the room, lay that kind of groundwork and then have different tracks and choices and then come back together maybe for a presentation day. Like I would really like to be able to, to play around with that and to create some more, more student choice. What I ended up doing was in the very final reflection module, I, 
I gave them a list of all the texts I've ever taught in this course. So not here's what you missed out on, <laughs> right? But also ones that I've done a couple times that didn't really work out, so they haven't stayed on the course. And I asked students to give some ideas of what they thought could be added to the course, because right. then I know what they're actually reading and, and enjoying. So I don't think I could do 50% on participation grade in an in-person course. Mm -hmm. I don't think I could, I could um, evaluate that properly. So, thank you, I, Sally. Just, just while it's top of mind for me, I don't know if you know that George Kovacs has worked on that kind of structure already. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be interesting. I'm sure he would give you yeah. permission to to look at his course if you're thinking about do these three modules, and then I think he has 17 that people can choose from. Wow. Uh, but but that sort of choose your own adventure after you do the foundation might work well. That's great. Uh, but related to, to, to race question, one of the questions that I had was your decision that, that you talked about in Cichlet to remove the midterm. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that choice, what that meant for students, what I don't want to say replaced, but how that translated into the remote environment you were saying earlier. Yeah. Uh, that it removed some sort of motivation, right? That motivation that people have to consolidate their learning or at least to come studied, having studied a few hours the night before, ready for that midterm or wherever that looks like. Uh, could you talk about the decision to take away that midterm, what replaced it or how you translated it into the remote environment and how that worked or what you might do differently the next time? That was only about eight questions in one. so. Choose your own yeah, adventure. I, I definitely can. I mean, I think that I thought that it worked as motivation before. And, and that motivation was replaced by voice thread being worth a lot. Like that was a straightforward way to motivate, uh, not necessarily the best way to motivate, right? But I think that, that that happened. I had started doing the midterm when the Trent rules changed uh, the amount of the grade that was due by the, the date. And I don't think that's a great reason to make a pedagogical choice. So I've never been comfortable with it. And what I was able to do was give enough of the participation grade by that date that I was covering off that 25%. So the other ways that I've done it it, when it's been in person without a midterm is that rotating paper or presentation choice has always happened before the drop date. Right. And again, that's kind of in some ways the wrong reasons for making a pedagogical choice, but that's something that I've done. And then that does push all that grading to the first half, but it then gives me something to build on in the second half because everybody's done that, that work. Um, so I, I'm not convinced that I was ever testing what needed to be tested through through the midterm and also from a kind of universal design for learning or general accessibility um, or just human approach. I think that not having an exam allows for more points of access into a course. And I really want to keep building on that kind of idea of multiple points of access, right? So maybe a midterm will become an option, right? That students could choose between doing a paper and a, like a two of paper presentation and midterm or final even it was something I was thinking about the way that I did the final exam as I called it, the take home exam, which really was an essay. I could give them a choice between a take home essay or an in-person exam because some people, and I was one of them, I did great on exams and they motivated me, right? And it's like, I found it easier because it's like, well, I only need to really pay attention for two hours, right? Just spit that out onto the page and, and I'm done. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what other questions do people have? Well, this is a great opportunity. Oh, Nadine. Yeah, I think um, it's, it's complimentary to a question that Ray asked. So thanks very much, Sally. I'm just curious how um, you felt that you and the students were connected uh, 
throughout the course. And if there was some waxing and waning, um, perhaps during the term and what, if there were, especially during the waning parts, what you have been reflecting about, to, about what to do in the future if that arose. Yeah, I think I didn't actually notice a waxing and waning of the engagement. I found Cichlet was pretty engaged from the beginning and throughout. Health Humanities took a bit more time and it was mostly through my feedback on their assignment. The voice thread discussion did not go as well. It was a little bit more um, automated sounding. And so that did set up a dynamic, right, of uh, them having a relationship with me more than with each other. Although I did try to create an exercise where they were doing kind of a role playing diagnostic exercise with each other, but um, didn't quite choose the right tool. Nursing students already do a lot of simulation, so it was a bit too sim similar to that for them and harder to break them out into like, this is your, what I did is I had them like read an essay and then pretend to be the doctor who wrote the essay diagnosing a character from another essay, right? I think I would approach that differently, maybe through a discussion board uh, next time. But yeah, what, what it meant um, was a bit more, uh, perhaps a bit more playing to me for grades in that in the way that we were connection connecting over feedback. I did get some students fill out the kind of midterm questionnaire that I did appreciating how much feedback they got and how quickly, which, which felt good. I, that also did set up a dynamic though, once I didn't get the grades up within three days and students were wondering what was wrong, right? So by trying to be really fast at the beginning, I would maybe actually slow it down at the beginning and then <laughs> ramp it up in terms of student um, expectations. But I am thinking about how to do better on that building community among the students in health humanities next year. And I think that one of the ways to do that is to make the that idea of how the final assignments were public on that website or that sooner with some of the studio assignments, not public, but sort of let's practice this internally as a group, whether it's on VoiceThread or Flipgrid or, you know, we'll Padlet, like we'll figure out how to do that so that they get used to talking to each other and seeing what each other is creating. And that I think will spark ideas because I, I, I mean, I think we're all finding this. There isn't really the perfect discussion board type tool yet, right? Or even I don't think there's one that's good enough. I'll, I'll come out and say that. There isn't even a good enough one. I don't know. I have you on record now, Sally, as saying uh, that you appreciate the beauty of a discussion board. So <laughs> that's true. That's true. I did say that as a side. I mean, I would love to use the Blackboard one, but it's not easy for students to post like the things that they want to post on it. I, yeah, so. Okay, Dana, I can't hear you. I think you can hear me now, yeah? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. I had a button pushed. Um, as you were speaking about like sort of creating that interaction in health humanities, one of the things that I was thinking about is it's such an interdisciplinary class. And I wonder if you could sort of almost use that like I was just thinking about like panels of students from different disciplines sort of commenting on the same thing or on each other's work, but really trying to use the interdisciplinarity to kind of build these like review panels or teams um, might be an interesting way. Because I, I mean, having worked with students in a lot of the departments you talked about, I can imagine they just speak such different languages um, and particularly in assessment, you know, they've been taught such different ways to, to do assessments um, that it would be really interesting for them to talk to each other in their different languages about like a common assessment or thing. Um, so it might be just a kind of neat way to get them talking, but also be really explicit about that interdisciplinarity. 
That's a great idea. Yeah. And another way of having them situate themselves. Cause I think I was a bit vague and sort of situate yourself, either your, you know, your schooling, your work or your personal experience in relation to the course. Cause I didn't want to be forcing students to disclose, although some students really did disclose a lot of personal kind of medical information, as you could expect, given the topic, right? But really more explicitly saying, or what you learned as a nurse, or how does this connect to how you want to be? Because I had some uh, students from social work as well in the course. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. And then what might you learn from another discipline, right? Yeah, love it. All right, uh, I'm, I'm trying to be a little conscious of time here. We're about an, an hour in and Sally's been very generous already with her thoughtful reflections uh, and her, her, her remarks and also answering questions uh, from all of us. Uh, I wanted to say thank you again to Sally for being here. Thank you again to all of you for being here. Uh, I really appreciate it. I learned a lot. I'm thinking a bit more about why there is beauty in discussion boards sometimes it's when they when students have a sense of audience uh, and that's something that i wrote down and also this sense of scaffolding even creative assignments i think is super important that i sometimes lose sight of uh, so i've written those two down for for my own learning uh, and wanted to uh, share my appreciation again with you and also everyone in this room thanks so much for coming by everybody great to see your faces <laughs>